Good afternoon, everybody. It's Dr. Galvin with a coronavirus update. Actually, we're going to do a coronavirus refresher today because things seem to be changing and the virus numbers seem to be going up. And so I'm going to go back, I think, through the basics and kind of we'll talk a little bit about the virus. Before we do that, in case you're new to the series, my name is Jeffrey Galvin. I'm a physician in North Carolina. I'm board certified in emergency medicine and obesity medicine, and I work in a local emergency department, but also run a functional medicine uh, clinic locally. So we, pr we uh, do updates on COVID. We've been doing them since the beginning of the uh, pandemic. And we're also starting to put out more and more content about wellness, which is kind of a passion of mine. And we're in the midst of a series, and we're starting out with weight loss, which seems to be something that's near and dear to a lot of people, especially with the pandemic and people being locked in and suddenly being okay to have, you know, differing dietary uh, routines than we normally do. So if you're interested in that, go to the YouTube ch channel and look for those things. We're working on getting on our website a, a page that's got all of our videos, including all the COVID videos, all the wellness videos. And we'll be doing an ongoing uh, series of videos about wellness, including weight loss, hormones, sleep, stress, nutrition, fitness, all the things that I'm really passionate about. But today, we're going to talk about the virus. And in particular, we're going to do a little bit of a, uh, a refresher course on what it is, you know, how it came about, what we need to know about it, how you get it, what the symptoms are, what to do about it, what the treatments are, and what the outlook looks like. As usual, we start with the numbers worldwide, 9 million cases, um, 470,000 deaths, 4.2 million people have recovered here in the U.S. We're at 2.35 million cases, 122,000 deaths. Uh, 726,000 recoveries in here in my state of North Carolina, 54,000 cases, 1,223 deaths. Unfortunately, in North Carolina, like many other states, our numbers are starting to skyrocket. Not only the cases are going up, but the number of hospitalizations are going to go up, or rather are going up, and we're going to talk about that. But first of all, let's do a little refresher. You know, this, you know, there's, there's two things. There's coronavirus and in particular you know the coronavirus is a big family of viruses that actually cause colds and mild upper respiratory infections you know year round they're not that big a deal but the particular virus we're, we're talking about is called SARS-CoV-2 and that virus causes an illness that we call COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 is a derivative of two other pretty severe coronaviruses that occurred in the past. One of them is SARS and one of them was MERS. And they were both highly fatal viruses that um, developed in the Middle East and in China. And luckily, because they were very deadly, they didn't really spread very much. This virus is a little bit different. It's much less deadly, but highly transmissible. And so lots and lots of people can get it. Most people are going to be fine with it. But there's a fairly large risk population that has the potential to, getting, to get very, very sick and potentially die from it. So the important thing to understand is it's a novel virus. And what that means is it's a virus that none of us have ever seen before. And because of that, we don't have any intrinsic immunity to it. Now, when the flu comes around every year, it's usually a mutation from the flu virus from the year before. So if we've had flu in the past, we actually have a little bit of, of intrinsic immunity to the flu. We might be able to fight that virus off because our body's seen something very similar to it. And when we do the flu vaccine, the flu vaccine isn't for the flu this year. It's actually a vaccine for the flu last year. And by utilizing, you know, typically the antibodies for the flu last year will, will treat the, uh, the flu this year. And that's why we kind of use this in inherited immunity from the year before. Well, since this is a brand new virus, nobody has any of that. So if you get exposed to it in sufficient quantity, you're going to probably get sick. Now, the first reports, it was originally you know, noted in China, and the first reports were up to a 5% mortality rate, which, you know, if you translate that to you know, the U.S., that could have been 15 million deaths. And so worldwide, you know, people took it very, very seriously. And then we had the outbreaks in Italy and New York City with very, very high mortality rates. And so the world locked down, not just us, but everywhere lockdown trying to contain the virus and it looks like those lockdowns did a pretty good job of limiting the spread of the virus and limiting the overwhelming of the healthcare system which is really the point point. and now we're sort of in this phase two and now going to phase three where we're reopening economies reopening um uh sort of social interactions 
but now we're starting to see increases in cases. Now, what does that that mean? Well, you know, we have people who are at risk and people who are, are at less risk. So who are the people who are at risk for this? Well, those are typically people who are over 65 or people that have underlying medical problems, in particular cardiovascular disease, so untreated hypertension, some kind of heart disease, valvular disease, people that are immunocompromised for some reason, they're on chronic steroids, they are undergoing um, immune suppression for some kind of medical problem, are under chemotherapy, people have chronic respiratory diseases like uh, emphysema, COPD, chronic bronchitis, people have diabetes, obesity, those groups of people are very, very high risk, and their risk of getting severe COVID and ultimately ending up in the hospital and potentially dying is much, much higher than those folks who are younger and are healthy. So we think that, you know, probably about, you know, roughly 99% of people that come down with the virus are going to recover, and they're going to recover and they're going to be fine. About 1% are going to go on to either need to be hospitalized or potentially, you know, are going to be uh, or end up dying. So maybe I should restate that. About somewhere between about half a percent and one percent are going to die, and maybe about you know three to five percent are going to end up in the hospital. But everybody else is going to be just fine. So we also know about twenty-five to forty percent of people are actually going to get the virus without symptoms, meaning they're going to be asymptomatic. They may still have the ability to spread that virus, but they're not going to display any symptoms. And so it makes it very challenging to track the virus and find out what's going on. The other thing we don't really know for sure is if you have this sort of asymptomatic presentation, does that make you immune? Because it seems like some of those people don't have the levels of antibodies required to maybe provide immunity, whereas people that seem to have the full-blown infection and actually get sick generate much higher levels of antibodies, and they typically are able to sort of fight, you know, probably have enough antibodies to prevent from getting it a second time. So we don't, there's a lot of unanswered questions. Remember, this just started basically in December, January is when we first learned about this. And so we're learning as we go along. Now, how do we get infected? Well, infection is exposure plus time. And so typically it's the spread from respiratory droplets. So as I'm sitting here speaking at the camera, you know, I'm sort of spewing microscopic droplets out of my mouth and they're going a certain distance and they're sort of falling to the ground. If I sneeze, I, I put out a big spray of those. And if you probably go on YouTube, you can probably get that high speed video of somebody sneezing. And it's like this huge cloud of particles. Well, remember that when you sneeze, you're probably expressing 300 million viral particles. We think that you need about an exposure of roughly a thousand particles to get infected. So that means that if I'm sitting in a room with somebody just reading, not saying anything, and I'm just breathing and I happen to have the virus and I'm pretty infectious, I'm going to probably infect that person in about an hour, just sitting in that room. Now, if I start talking, I'm going to rapidly increase the amount of droplets and amount of virus I'm expressing. And if I'm in that room talking to that person, I might infect them in five to ten minutes. And if I'm yelling or if I'm working out or if I'm singing, that might be a minute. Or if I sneeze or cough. So, you know, the more exposure you get, the, the worse it is. So what are the risky types of things? Well, indoors, enclosed spaces with heavy breathing, yelling, singing, talking, so what does that mean? Things like church services with singing, close proximity inside. Um, gyms, unfortunately, you know, small gyms with lots of, you know, uh, 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 hard breathing, aerobic, you know, decks, things like that are going to be areas of high spread. Um, you know, potentially things like, um, you know, uh, a uh, personal services industry like a hair salon or something like that where you're in close proximity. Now, interestingly, masks may be able to really cut down on this. There was a case recently, a case report of a hairdresser that was positive for COVID, but she was wearing a mask. She had 140 clients and nobody got it. So the mask, we wear masks to protect other people from getting those viral particles spewn out. And there's plenty of studies now that show that masks really cut down on transmission. So I've been talking about masks. You know, people get very upset about masks. It's not a personal freedom thing. It's a being a good person thing. Put the mask on when you go into the store, 
take it off when you go out. You don't need to be walking around outside with a mask, driving your car, but if we want to cut down on the numbers, we want to prevent spread and the masks are going to help. Now, what about symptoms? What typically happens? Well, if I happen to, you know, be working in the emergency department and I don't I go in to see a patient that I don't know has COVID and they sneeze in my face and I don't realize it and I get exposed to, you know, a million viral particles, I'm going to get it sick at that point because I have been exposed significantly. What does that look like? Well, for the next week to 10 to 14 days, that looks like nothing. I'm going to have no symptoms at all. But the virus is going to be multiplying in my, sim my system and I'm going to become increasingly infectious, meaning that I'm going to be, you know, more and more viral particles. I'm going to be expressing much more on day five than on day one. Indeed, if I get tested the day after I get coughed on, I'm going to be negative. I might be negative day five after I get coughed on. It may, I may not test positive for a week or more after exposure, and I may not develop any symptoms for seven to 10 days after that exposure. So by the time I've developed symptoms, I've been potentially spreading the virus to a bunch of people for maybe a week or more. So that's why we have to be worried. And that's why masks and, and social distancing and things like that, we know that that social distancing cuts down in the amount of viral particles you can get exposed to. So those are all things. Now, what are the symptoms I might develop? Well, it might be like flu-like things, body aches, cough, fever. I might get some GI symptoms, some nausea, maybe some diarrhea, maybe some vomiting, body aches, one of the classic things we're seeing is a loss of taste or smell. Um, some people get some congestion, very indistinguishable between from many, many other viral things. And for most people, they're going to have those symptoms for, you know, a week, you know, to 10 days or so, and then they're going to go away and they're going to be fine. Now, remember, they're infectious that whole time they have symptoms. They're infectious the whole week to 10 days that they were asymptomatic. But again, 99% of people are going to recover without any problems. It's that 1% that's going to go on to die or maybe 5% of those people that might end up sick enough to go into the hospital. What are those symptoms of more severe disease? Well, it's typically development of shortness of breath and respiratory distress. And then what happens is the, the virus seems to go from the lungs in those people into the vascular system. And then we have some things related to possible clotting disorders, things like peripheral clots, um, cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, strokes, things like that, that we think are related to clotting malfunctions related to the virus because it looks like the virus can actually attack endothelial tissue. So if it gets out of the pulmonary tissue, it can actually go and attack the tissue that's actually in blood vessels. So we've got this sort of, you know, this continuum from very, very mild or no symptoms to very, very sick and a lot, and there's a lot of variables that go in there. Now, that being said, Occasionally, we'll get a very young, healthy person that comes in extremely sick, and I've seen this multiple times now in the emergency department. Now, how do we avoid getting it? Well, we've talked about it. You know, the basic thing, social distancing, wear a mask when you go out and when you're close proximity to people. Avoid those situations where you are at low, you know, you're at high risk, meaning in close space, indoors, with lots of exposure to people, so bars, concerts, um, things like that. Now, what are we seeing now? We're seeing this big spike in cases. And in the South, who are we seeing those cases in? We're seeing it in young people. Why is it? Because you know, we've had these protests and now everyone's like, oh, the virus is so yesterday and people are going out. And I don't know about you, but in my own personal family life, all of a sudden we're hearing about all these, all my, my, I have two daughters who are in their 20s and they now have four friends who have recently come down with COVID. Two of them were in, in Wilmington, and apparently there were some bartenders in Wilmington that had it, and they exposed a bunch of people. And so there's a bunch of kids that were at bars in Wilmington who have now got the disease. Another one of my uh, daughter's friends had lunch with a friend from out of town. She had it, and she caught it, and then gave it to her family. And uh, we just heard about another kid today. All these kids are in their 20s, and they're getting you know flu-like symptoms, but they are getting symptoms. And so we're seeing high numbers in young people, which is, you know, okay because we're not going to see a lot of mortality with that. But in North Carolina, when we opened in phase two on the 22nd of, of May, we had about 570 hospitalizations. Well, today we have 870. So hospitalizations are going up steadily. So we are seeing these sort of sick people as well. 
sorry I'm on a flight path here and an airplane's flying over. So, you know, we've got to keep up this sort of, of, of surveillance and we've got to be careful because, you know, if numbers start spiking up again, you know, it's going to, the government's temptation is going to be shut everything down again. And we all agree we don't want that to happen. So we've got to do our part to try to minimize spread and take these precautions. And you got to tell your kids, listen, you got to look out for yourselves. You got to look out for others. And we've talked about that for a long time. We think that the prediction was that in the summertime, numbers were going to drop off fairly significantly, and then we were going to be prepared for a second wave in the fall. And that's typically the, the sort of what happens with these pandemics. They come in waves, and we've seen this before. So we expect that come fall, early winter, we're going to see a big jump in cases. So these, this spike we're seeing now is still the first wave. And so you know, if we're seeing a spike now, we're going to see a huge spike in the fall. And so we've got to get this under control if we want to keep sort of the things going. Um, how do we get through this? Well, we're not going to get through this until we either achieve herd immunity or we have an effective vaccination. And herd immunity means that about 60 to 70 percent of the population has it, and then there's just not any people really left for the virus to infect, and it kind of peters out, or an effective vaccination. And, you know, vaccines are difficult to produce, and they're difficult to produce safely. There are many I mean, 100 plus vaccine trials going on. There's seven or eight that are in final clinical trials, but you know, they've got to be proven safe. And so even if we find out the vaccine is effective, we still have a lot of safety testing to go through to make sure it's safe to actually give people. And then we've got to talk about, you know, the logistics of ramping up production to immunize billions of people worldwide and distributing that. So I think realistically, are we going to have an immunization in December? No. We might have a vaccine candidate ready in the first quarter of the year, but I don't know how long it's going to take to distribute that. So we're likely going to be seeing a different sort of social dynamic in terms of social distancing and things like this for at least a year or two is my, my prediction. I don't think we're going to get through this, you know, with a snap of the fingers. Um, you know, the challenges I think moving forward are trying to keep these new spikes under control, especially amongst young people, protecting the most vulnerable people, while at the same time getting people back to work, maintaining the economy, and and you know keeping the the country moving forward. Because we can't just sh shut everything down; it's going to cause more harm shutting everything down than than the virus is going to cause. Um, I. I kind of curious. We've done this once before. And again, at my clinic, I've been hearing lots of our, you know, we work with a lot of executives and things like that. I'm hearing from more and more of these people that they're, they're getting um, outbreaks in their businesses amongst their workforces that they weren't seeing a month ago. They're suddenly seeing, you know, people coming up positive or, or family members coming up positive. So in the comments today, if you would, Will you guys put down again whether or not you've, you've recently heard of somebody or know somebody or you yourself have been diagnosed and also how old and where? So it seems like there's a lot of younger people because they're, they're kind of not following the rules. You know, young people, they're going to do that. But I'm curious to know. We had some really good feedback the last time we did this. Um, I'm going to be posting um, part three of the weight loss thing. I think on Wednesday, if we can get it filmed in time, if not, it'll be on Thursday. We'll probably do another um, coronavirus thing later in the week. And um, we're going to talk to Dr. Hogenkamp again. We'll probably do another Q&A maybe next week. As usual, wash your hands. That's another big one to prevent the virus. Wash your hands. Look after yourselves. Look after your families. Look after those around you. Like us on uh, Facebook. Follow us on YouTube. Subscribe. We'll be back with more. Um, go to our website, and we hopefully this week we'll have a central repository of all the videos, including all the COVID videos going way back to May. Um, anyway, have a great day, and I will talk to you soon. Good night.